Being a government official is tough. You're expected to cut taxes, up spending on infrastructure and public services, and kiss every baby in sight, even the snotty ones. Unfortunately, having less money coming into the government via taxes and more money going out of the government via public spending is a recipe for, well, no money. Luckily, like your friend when they're short on rent, governments can borrow money too. But of course, loans are supposed to be paid back, even if you're a government and even though there's no actual mechanism for making them cash in. The US government has been spending borrowed money for a while. The country has trillions of dollars in debt as they try to keep taxes low while still increasing spending. Politicians on both sides of the aisle find themselves drawn to spending money they don't actually have, even if pretty much everyone wants less government debt. But this explanation, popularity, is a very simplified reason for why debt spending happens in governments. There's way more to it than that. The way a government uses spending can be crucial to keeping the economy humming along, but there are always additional consequences when you spend money you don't have. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall, Macroeconomics. Now, you don't have debt without first having a deficit. A deficit happens when you spend more than you make, which for a government means that tax revenue is lower than spending. It's basically just a shortfall in that year's budget. A deficit is a flow variable since it's measured over time, in this case, a year. But once deficits build on each other year to year, they become part of the overall debt of a country. When we hear the national debt is rising, it's really the accumulated deficits that aren't being paid back year after year. National debt is a stock variable because it's a snapshot of exactly how much is owed at this exact moment. As of January 2024, for the US, that number is $34 trillion. It makes my palms sweat just thinking about it since most of us have been taught that too much debt is bad news. But it may help to think about government debt more like a long-term mortgage on a house than a high-interest credit card debt. As long as you adhere to your payment plan, it's an important investment that will ultimately pay off. But deficit spending is about more than just keeping voters happy and holding on to political power. It's a core part of fiscal policy, an area of lawmaking devoted to using taxation and spending to influence the economy. Fiscal policy helps regulate the economy when it gets out of whack, either running too hot with rising inflation or too cold as businesses cut production and make layoffs, leading to a recession. Luckily, the government can intervene to make some of the lows less low by, you guessed it, spending big. Borrowing more, spending more, and running the government budget at a deficit can help soften the bigger blows of a recession. When the banking crisis in 2008 shook consumer confidence and reduced available jobs, the government put together a large spending bill that bought everything from new roads to new social programs, creating jobs and income. Those people then spent their money on other goods and services, sending an infusion of cash into the sluggish economy. Rather than falling into a new Great Depression, uh, according to some economists, the choice to spend at a deficit really helped lessen the long-term impact of the recession. Of course, those controversial bank bailouts may have had something to do with that too. And the idea is that when the economy is doing well and the government doesn't need to spend so high, the taxes coming in would make up for any previous deficit spending and reduce the total debt. But in real life, it's way more common to run a deficit than a surplus or a balanced budget each year, so the debt grows. But as far as I know, there's no bank out there where the president can walk in and ask for a trillion dollar loan so the way the government is able to borrow in the first place is through lots and lots of smaller loans from people, companies, and even other countries. As of early 2024, the US public has fronted about $27 trillion to the US government, while the governments of other countries have loaned out about another $7 trillion. Most of that foreign debt is owned by our neighbors across the Pacific, China and Japan. And while it may seem scary to consider that we owe literally trillions on trillions to other governments, it's pretty unlikely that any of these countries will decide they want their money back all at once. Because the world economy is tied to the US dollar, a huge economic blow like a government demanding immediate repayment would make things such a mess for not only the US economy, but pretty much everyone. 
Plus, a country like China couldn't cash in all their US debt at once anyway, thanks to varying maturity dates. When the government borrows money from individuals and governments, they do so through selling things known as bonds. Government bonds. A bond is an investment that can be bought to help a government raise money for public spending. They're a type of debt instrument, which is just any form of borrowing that raises capital for a government or firm. The simplest idea of a bond is that it's an IOU, like a kid at a lunch table saying, if you give me $2 for a donut now, I'll give you $3 next week from my birthday money. When you buy a bond from the government, you're loaning them your money now, which they promise to pay back after a set amount of time, plus interest. As you might imagine, that promise of interest is the basic motive for investors to choose bonds. Certain types are also seen as less risky than, say, stocks and companies. On average, more companies fail and can't pay back their investors than governments. Hopefully. The three types of bonds are treasury bills, treasury bonds, and treasury notes. <laughs> totally distinct names, right? Not hard to remember at all. People choose between them based on when they mature or are paid back and how much interest they earn. For instance, the fastest maturing and therefore least risky are T-bills which is coincidentally my DJ name. With T-bills, you only wait a matter of weeks or maybe a few months before you get your money back. T-notes are a little riskier with maturation dates in the two to 10 year range, but yield slightly higher returns and make the risk worthwhile. And T-bonds, like men such as myself, can take about 30 years to mature, but they definitely pay the most in interest. No risk, no reward, baby. Having all these different ways to borrow money gives the US government more flexibility so they don't ever have to pay all their debt back at once. That way, they have the freedom to make choices about things like taxes and spending as the economic landscape changes over time. But government borrowing isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Like the rest of economics, it's filled with trade-offs. With all these nice interest-bearing bonds floating around, we have to remember that governments don't run a deficit in a vacuum. In theory, everyone who opts to buy a US bond has less money to invest through private investments like stocks or real estate lending. That leads to something called crowding out, an economic theory where more government borrowing changes the market for loanable funds. In this theory, to convince folks to loan to private businesses rather than loaning to the government, the businesses and individuals have to sweeten the pot by paying more in interest on their loans. This means it ends up being costlier for businesses and individuals to borrow and invest for private projects like startups. This isn't always a bad thing, but a government does have to calculate opportunity cost before selling a ton of bonds to throw down a huge spending bill. They balance the idea that funding government spending takes away from private firms. Plus, the more the government borrows in bonds, the more it's got to pay back in interest, meaning today's taxes are funding the borrowing of yesteryear. And when the tax revenue can't keep up with ongoing payments on the national debt, it's a real bad spot for governments and can actually slow economic growth, like we've seen in Greece. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, Greece was in some pretty dire financial straits. On top of the general international financial turmoil and low national productivity, it also came out that not only were wealthy billionaires not paying out their fair share to the government, but the government had been vastly underreporting its total national debt. Confidence in the Greek economy plummeted faster than a donkey tossed off a Mediterranean cliffside as people began to worry the government would default on their bonds. The Greek government raised taxes over and over again between 2010 and 2016 to try to pad out the national coffers. Simultaneously, this financial havoc dropped Greece's national production even farther, tanking the country's GDP and the rest of their economy along with it. Greece was stuck. They struggled to make their debt repayments and things were spiraling out of control. People began to riot in the streets, unemployment skyrocketed, and many who could emigrate did. In the end, the Greek government needed to be bailed out by the European Central Bank, the European Commission, and the International Monetary Fund, totaling somewhere in the ballpark of 300 billion euros. While Greece's economy has recovered significantly, I, as of 2024, unemployment is hovering around 11% compared to the whopping 28% of 2014. The turmoil of the financial crisis and the toll it took on its residents is a reminder for governments to stop and think before borrowing big. We started this series talking about scarcity, trade-offs, and opportunity costs. Economics is the study of what we do with unlimited wants and unlimited resources. And governments aren't exempt. 
because many governments want to provide services and cut taxes and also help avoid intense economic downturns. They constantly have to prioritize their spending. Sometimes things shake out in favor of deficit spending, creating jobs and income and providing important services and support. But while long-term deficit spending can be sustainable, it can also result in economic crises, which can mean devastating things for individual people. And while a promise to drastically lower taxes, expand public services, and magically erase debt would definitely be popular with voters, in our world of scarcity, it's just not gonna happen. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you wanna help us out, give this video a like, comment if your spending habits are better than the government's, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.